All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, today's lecture content that we'll be discussing is the cytoskeleton, uh, and we'll be talking about that within the context of listeriosis. Uh, listeriosis is an infection of the GI system or the central nervous system, uh, which might sound a little bit familiar to our previous lecture with uh, botulism. Uh, in this case, listeria infections are caused by the bacterium listeria minocytogenes, or just commonly referred to as listeria. Uh, it is typically uh, a bacterium that's found in the soil and that becomes an invasive pathogen. Uh, invasive pathogens are typically uh, are denoted by their aggressive uh, behavior to try and invade some sort of host. Uh, and they're typically characterized by their expression of a virulence factor. Uh, virulence factors are usually small molecules that helps to enable their invasiveness. Typically, listeri uh, listeriosis infections are occur by consuming either raw meat or unwashed vegetables that are contaminated. Uh, some of you might remember about five years ago or so, there was a huge uh, listeriosis outbreak at Chipotle's across Virginia, uh, including here in Charlottesville, uh, which was also, I think, listeriosis and E. coli and um, a, a couple of other issues at once. Uh, but also similarly, there was uh, in Virginia, there was also a couple of years ago an issue with uh, cantaloupe having uh, listeria contamination. Uh, and uh, this is a reminder to wash your vegetables and uh, to try and not consume raw meat um, or undercooked meat. Uh, the prevalence is around 1,600 infections uh, and also 260 deaths a year annually in the United States. And typically, there are 0.3 infections per 100,000 people. The symptoms and complications. Uh, the greatest concern are for people with certain risk factors. Usually, risk factors are characteristics of certain populations with a higher risk or a higher susceptibility. And the, under, uh, the, the, the populations that are at risk are older adults, pregnant women, newborns and immunocompromised individuals. And you can typically think of all of these and all of these populations as individuals with uh, that are immunocompromised to varying degrees. The symptoms are typically host dependent. So typically for healthy people, uh, it's oftentimes it oftentimes presents with diarrhea and fever, uh, which might not sound like it might not that sounds on that doesn't sound very great. But relative to how it affects immunocompromised individuals, it's rather uh, th that's pretty benign. Usually for pregnant women, they experience fever, muscle aches, diarrhea, can lead to a miscarriage, premature deliver delivery, or uh, in worst cases, the infection of the fetus. Uh, at higher risk individuals, uh, it can lead to some of those same symptoms, but also loss of balance, convulsions, GI symptoms, and meningitis in the more fatal instances. And typically, uh, to a, for immunocompromised individuals, because this is uh, a food-associated or soil-associated uh, infection, typically they're oftentimes recommended to avoid raw sushi, uncooked deli meat in particular, and avoiding soft cheeses. Uh, yes? Uh, is it just uh, pregnant women? Is there a general difference or just individuals? Uh, pregnant individuals in general. So the way listeria uh, works is that it invades the GI epithelium. Uh, if you remember, the epithelium uh, was as a cell sheet barrier that typically lines uh, mucosal layers. And it has these tight junctions that usually don't allow for things to cross over. But what ends up happening in the case of listeriosis is that uh, the bacterium is endocytosed by uh, the epithelium lining. And once it's within the endosome, what'll end up happening is it'll escape the endosome and start shooting around with this comet tail within 
within the cell and it'll actually burst through to try and get to the, an adjacent, it'll, forgive me, it'll proliferate, it'll grow, and then uh, subsequent bacteriums will then push through the cell membrane and actually shield itself with the cell membrane, al allowing it to evade immune surveillance because it's in, uh, ensheathed or encased by the cell membrane. And then it'll actually shoot through and puncture the cell membrane, uh, entering in an adjacent cell, infecting that one. Uh, and so I think this will work here. There we go. So as you can see, it is moving around throughout the cell and there's this comet tail that propels it uh, throughout the cell. And you might see that it kind of bumps into the uh, cell membrane. Sometimes it might be able to uh, uh, puncture out, but then it'll come back in because there's no uh, adjoining cell nearby. And so the main reason why uh, we're using listeriosis as our clinical backdrop or clinical wrapper is that the comet tail that allows it to propel through the cell is it's uh, hijacking or taking advantage of a cell cy cytoskeleton to kind of like polymerize behind it and shoot it around. So uh, as the pre-lecture uh, laid out for you, the cytoskeleton, yes. Let me go back one slide. It evades immune surveillance by when it's trying to uh, go into an adjoining cell, it's actually wrapped around by the cell membrane here. And usually we have proteins on every single one of our cells. So what's a good way to say this? Every cell in your body has a protein on it that says it belongs to you. And typically when those cells are healthy, if they're not in, uh, infected by a virus, uh, that protein is expressed properly. And if an Im if immune cell comes over here and tries to assess this cell, it will see this protrusion, but it'll say, it, you know, it has these regular proteins. This is a cell, it's normal. And so it evades immune surveillance because it's wrapped by our own cell's membrane. So the cytoskeleton is this really robust filamentous network throughout the entire cytoplasm of a cell. And it also includes the proteins that bind to them that serve a variety of functions. Um, you can envision the cytoskeleton as, uh, it helps give structure and shape to cells, but also prov uh, provides a functional role in lots, of different, um, in lots of different processes throughout cell biology. Uh, these, what's important to note is that these filaments of the cytoskeleton they consist of these monomers. Monomers are single units that then come together that polymerize into a polymer. So monomer, mono one, mer unit, come together, they all stack together to form a polymer, poly many, mer unit. So they come together to form many units that create these filaments that are our cytoskeleton. And the way in which they come together is typically by self-assembly. So the assembly of these filaments are pretty tightly regulated. They, uh, they all grow or sh shrink by either the addition or the loss of these monomers. And we'll talk about, uh, we'll talk about a few key uh, rules that determine that loss or addition. And the growth of these uh, cytoskeleton filaments as monomers come, to go, come together to form a polymer filament, we call that polymerization. Uh, polymerization is regulated by three key rules here. One, it's concentrate uh, the concentration of the monomers. If there's a high concentration of the monomers, there's a more likely to there's a higher likelihood of polymerization to occur. Um, there's also accessory proteins that are really important, particularly with microtubules and microfilaments that we'll talk about today, that help to regulate and control this polymerization. And uh, in addition to that, phosphorylation is another event that's pretty critical, particularly with intermediate filaments. We're not gonna get to myosin today um, that help to regulate this dynamic. So there are three key phases to polymerization uh, for uh, cytoskeleton filaments. Uh, the first phase is referred to as the nucleation event. And so if you can envision each of these ovals as a single monomer, um, and this, this polymerization is a helpful way to think about across all of the 
uh, all of the cytoskeleton proteins. So the first event is a nucleating event where eventually we'll have a dimer, two monomers come together, or a trimer, three of them coming together. And this is the nucleation event where they finally come together to form an initial polymer. Uh, and this is the rate limiting step for polymerization. Once this happens, we have a high concentration of monomers in the surrounding area. So then now that we have the beginning or the uh, a nucleation of this polymer starting to form, the other monomers will come, to, will come over and start elongating this filament. And this phase, as you can imagine, is called elongation. It's a, a, a consistent linear growth, a linear growth rate of the cytoskeleton filament. And eventually, as the concentration of the monomer starts to go down, because there's only so much monomer available, it'll eventually start to slow down and reach a steady state where the rate at addition and removal of these monomers um, tapers out and we reach steady state here. So again, a, a key, the key first step is nucleation. That's the rate limiting step. Once that nucleating event occurs, there's enough available monomers around to begin adding onto the growing filament during elongation. And as the concentration of the surrounding monomer goes down, that'll slow down this polymerization where it reaches a steady state where the rate of on and the rate of off uh, equals out. That rate of on and rate of off is uh, pretty key to think about here. Um, and you can also think about polymerization as like a chemical reaction where, uh, where there's the monomer, which we'll just call M, uh, that's being added on to an existing filament. And if we consider the rate of change of the length of the filament, we can call K on as like the rate of the rate of, the rate at which uh, association happens to the growing filament. K off is the rate of disassociation, and M is the con in, uh, concentration of monomer uh, with that association unit. Um, the t the point at which uh, the point at which it reaches steady state, uh, that equation comes out to zero because it's uh, the, the rate of addition and the rate of subtraction is equal to each other. And so it's pretty key to think about that steady state where the rate of on and the rate of off equal out because if we uh, manipulate this formula to, uh, to find the substate concentration at which, is, at which it's at steady state, we call that, sub, that steady state monomer concentration the critical concentration. So the, crit the critical concentration is the point at which the rate of uh, monomer addition and monomer subtraction is equal to one another. And we call that the critical concentration. And what's important to consider is that if our current, if in our current milieu in the current surrounding area where we might have a filament, if the monomer concentration is higher than the critical concentration, we'll have filament growth, we'll have polymerization. If the monomer concentration is less than the critical concentration, the filament will shrink and monomers will start uh, being removed from the filament. And so just to repeat it, because it's pretty key, the critical concentration is the monomer concentration at which uh, the rate of growth and the rate of shrinking are equal to one another. It's steady state. Yes. Uh, hold that thought. It, it, it is important to know that, and we're going to get to that later. That's a great question. So one class of cytoskeleton proteins are called microtubules. Uh, Microtubule is kind of an antiquated term for these. We typically refer to them as tubulin, usually. So tubulin is one class of cytoskeleton proteins. And uh, interestingly enough, they're also a GTP ACE. Uh, if anyone can remember from our previous lecture, what does that ACE suffix usually mean? Enzyme. That it's an enzyme. So what that means here is that um, it's a it's an enzyme for GTP. That GTP is its substrate. Okay, it has an affinity and it will bind to GTP. So tubulin dimers will form together. So two monomers, two tubulin monomers will come together, and that dimer is a GTPase. It'll bind and has an affinity for GTP. And so once that happens, 
then uh, it'll uh, to that tubulin GTP uh, complex will is what is enabled to add on and help with the growth of a tubulin filament. So tubulin filaments have a minus end and a plus end. Uh, the minus end of uh, tubulin filaments are usually stabilized, as our pre uh, described, in these microtubulin organizing centers. So they're stabilized in these, uh, in these centers. The plus end is where growth occurs for tubulin filaments. That's key to know. So the plus end is where tubulin growth occurs. And it occurs by, GTP, by uh, tubulin GTP adding on to the plus end. And what's really key is that uh, as more tubulin GTP adds on to the growing filament, we have what's called a GTP cap. Uh, that, again, this is my colorblind moment here, that green region to the right, the GTP cap, I appreciate the head nod, I see you and I appreciate you. Uh, uh, th so that plus end is the GTP cap. And what's really key is that it lowered, the presence of a GTP cap lowers the critical concentration. That means it's lowering the threshold for growth to occur. So that GTP cap is really helpful for tubulin growth and tubulin, tubulin polymerization. Now, what's important to know is, uh, as you can tell by the different color regions, G again, GTP uh, tubulin is a GTP ace. It will hydrolyze the GTP to become GDP. It'll go from guanosine triphosphate to guanosine diphosphate. And that's what the uh, non-green region to the left is. Uh, and so what ends up happening over time is that as, uh, as GTP is hydrolyzed, uh, it'll kind of, it'll go from this green region to non-green region. And as we have less tubulin GTP available, the hydrolysis rate of GTP to GTP will start to, uh, will start to catch up with the growth and addition of these other monomers. And so then we'll lose that GTP cap. And once we lose that GTP cap, we lose that lowered critical concentration. So now that threshold for addition goes up and we start to get shrinking and removal of some of these tubulin G GDP units. And so what ends up happening is it shrinks and goes away, but then eventually, uh, there will reach a point where there's going to be enough monomer that binds to GTP and will promote growth again. So it's this like cyclical process of growth and shrinkage, growth and shrinkage. And so um, what is critical to know here if, uh, to kind of help kind of hone in on like what the take home message here is. Oh, yes. Do you have a question? It's where it's stable. So the minus end is stabilized in the MTOC, the microtubule organizing center, the plus end is where growth occurs for, for tubulin. At the, sorry, at the bottom of what? No, so this is, uh, so it's like above. So this, all on the left is minus end, all on the right is plus end. So the, both the growth and shrinkage occurs on the plus end. Did you have a question as well? So uh, the tubulin will, uh, via hydrolysis, will convert GTP to GDP, GDP. Yes, they're approaching themselves and they're, they're GTP ace. Both, uh, the, both tubulin and it's uh, it's hot, it's hot being hydrolyzed, so a water molecule promotes the shedding of the phosphate group to, for it to become GDP. And then what, what causes... So what causes the shrinkage is once enough of the GTPs have been hydrolyzed to GDP, and there's less monomer available of tubulin, uh, the GTP cap will be will no longer be present. That will cause that critical to rise back up. And now, because the critical concentration is up here, and perhaps let's say our monomer concentration is down here, if, if the monomer concentration is below our critical concentration, we get, we get uh, 
shrinkage or we get monomeral loss. We get filament uh, filament shrinkage. Does that make sense? Because the GTP cap is gone, it's it's a twofold problem. The GTP cap is gone, and our monomer surrounding concentration is reduced. Those two things together cause tubulin filament shrinkage. So, so I'm not going to ask you to write out the reaction of what occurs. Like it, the the key thing to note here is that the tubulin is a GTPase. It has an affinity and it, its substrate is GTP. Okay, and via a hydrolytic reaction, GTP becomes GDP. So it loses that that phosphate group, and now we start to lose our GTP cap. We start to have lower monomer concentration, and that prompts the tubulin filament to shrink. And I think on the next slide will actually help illustrate that a little bit better here. We also call that shrinkage catastrophe, the rapid uh, falling apart of the tubulin filament. Um, the next slide I think does a pretty good job of trying to illustrate this. Um, we, this we, we kind of dub this dynamic instability, but as you can see, we have one fil tubulin filament that's growing. And eventually as the uh, GTP cap goes away, well, end up happening is catastrophe, the, the shrinkage of that tubulin filament. And so it'll fall apart. And then those, what'll end up happening is tubulin is a GTPase. It has an affinity for GTP, not GDP. So it will disassociate from GDP. It will bind to a new GTP molecule. And that's how it uh, goes from that gray to green and will bind to another uh, tubulin filament that's ready to polymerize and grow. So there's a bit of a recycling here with our tubulin monomers. And once there, once that catastrophe and shrinkage happens, I'll take one step back. Once that catastrophe happens, they'll lose GDP, bind to a new GTP molecule, and then promote the polymerization of other local tubulin filaments. And the, what, the way this looks typically, if you were staining for tubulin filaments and to look at them, this dynamic instability, if you look at a couple of these fibers, um, these filaments, you can kind of see how some grow and some shrink, some grow and some shrink. So it's this di dynamic dance of instability where as one grows, it'll shrink back and those tubulin monomers uh, will lose GDP. It's a GTPase so that has an affinity for GTP, bind to a new GTP molecule, and then promote the polymerization of a different tubulin filament. I want to stop there for a couple of questions. Yes. It's, a, it's part of the reason why. So uh, so part of the reason, uh, you just to make sure I, I'm following your question, does the lower monomer concentration promote the loss of GTP cap? So it's part of the reason why. So as the as the, there's lower monomer concentration, that rate of growth, of that rate of polymerization starts to slow down. And as it slows down, the rate of um, GTP being hydrolyzed starts to match up with, starts to catch up. And we lose that GTP cap because the monomer concentration is starting to the lower concentration slows down the road of the growth of the rate of growth. Uh, yes. What, uh, just to make sure I understand your question, you're asking what is a tubulin filament growing for? Or, yeah, like if, if it grows and it shrinks again, it grows and shrinks again. Like, well, so it is, it, uh, well, so it's the cytoskeleton. So, like, you know, it stays within the cell, but it depends on the cell state and what it's trying to do. Um, and we'll actually, um, there are a couple of key functions that we're going to talk about later in this lecture about times at which particularly you see uh, really strong tubulin, tubulin fiber polymerization, that's really key. And then it just kind of like falls apart really rapidly. But yeah, like it, uh, it depends on the, it, it's context dependent when you'll see like really crazy tubulin uh, polymerization occurring. Uh, is there like four questions here? I'm gonna go here, 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 here. So uh, I think your hand was up earlier, go ahead.
Uh, is there a specific end from which GDP is disassociated? So like it starts at the positive end and moves towards the minus end. And then once there's, exactly, yes. Uh, I think I was gonna go here, here, yeah, you go ahead. Does a single, you mean a single filament? Uh, does it ever reach equilibrium and just like stay that length? Not really. I mean, to my knowledge, it's it just it's so dynamic. It's like constantly there's constant turnover. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so when the catastrophe of one filament uh, finishes, do you regain the end cap? And if so is it uh, a phosphate attaching to that end phosphate uh, GDP or? Great question. Just to make sure I just to make sure I'm understanding your question, that I think is a great question. Um, as it as it loses, uh, as it as catastrophe happens to regain that GTP cap, is that phosphorylized? Yeah. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. So good question. It's not phosphorylized. So again, um, tubulin is a GTPase. It has it's an enzyme whose substrate is GTP. It does not have an affinity for GDP. So once catastrophe happens and tubulin is away from the filament, tubulin monomers are away from the filament, it will disassociate from GDP. Now, there are other GTP molecules in the local space that then it has an affinity for and will bind to a new GTP. And there are other, uh, we talked about a few accessory proteins that help regulate polymerization. There's uh, these exchange factors that hold onto GTP molecules or GDP molecules that help uh, provide um, that help provide the GTP needed uh, for tubulin and then for polymerization to occur. So it's not a phosphorylation event on the filament. It's rather that tubulin lets go of GDP, finds a new GTP, and then is ready for polymerization. Yes? Uh, this actually goes back to, I think, uh, someone else's question of, uh, basically, I think both of you are asking, like, why is this happening? What's the advantage? We're actually going to get to that in just a moment. So hold, hold on to those thoughts. Um, so one of the reasons in which this is so key and so helpful is that is a, it, it helps facilitate chromosome segregation during mitosis. So if you remember the... Minus end is stabilized in these mTOCs, the microtubule organizing centers. Uh, for most mammalian cells, those are going to be uh, those are going to be centrosomes. Uh, an old term for it is also spindle pores. So when you see those three terms together, they're all kind of referring to the same thing. So what ends up happening is that during during mitosis, what ends up happening is that the uh, the microtubule will begin to polymerize and it will help promote the division or divide, the pulling apart of chromosomes during mitosis that make up the mitotic spindle. So the, again, the mitotic spindle is uh, comprised of the mTOC, the microtubulin, and the chromosome, those three things kind of coming together. And what ends up happening is that that positive end that's polymerizing growing out binds to a region of the chrom chromosome called the centromere. That's kind of the, the central region. And the particular part that it connects to is called the kinetic core. It's this large macromolecular protein structure that the positive end will bind to. And it's actually pretty, it's pretty fascinating because it's almost like this force sensitive process by which as it anchors onto at the kinetic core, will start pulling, literally pulling apart the chromosome during mitosis. And so going back to questions of why this is important and what's the evolutionary, evolutionary advantage here, if, if there is a defect in microtubule polymerization or microtubule um, uh, or in tubulin formation, you know, this has dramatic effects on mitosis, on the ability for chromosome segregation uh, that is you know, constantly happening throughout all cells. So to appreciate what this looks like, you can the if you consider the strength, so this is stained for tubulin. If you consider the brightness uh, uh, being an indication of tubulin polymerization, you'll see that the tubulin fibers will be kind of meeting at the middle where the chromosome is. It will pull them apart, and then the cell will kind of divide from one cell into two, 
And then there's rapid catastrophe immediately of the tubulin filament that then enables uh, the cytoskeleton of those new daughter cells uh, to form. Yes. So in the video that you showed earlier, it seemed like all the microscopes were assembling the stem almost randomly. Mm -hmm. So how are, in this particular process, how are they all assembling at a specific rate and all just assembling at one rate? What controls that? What's controlling the this uh, this seemingly, compared to what appeared random, what's occurring that's promoting this like seemingly like really coordinated event? So there are a series of, uh, typically during mitosis, there's a series of uh, other proteins that are expressed that help to coordinate this uh, cell division. And so during this phase, uh, during this phase of mitosis, where you have the alignment of the chromosomes, uh, you can think of like everything being poised at this point once the chromosomes are lined up, for filament for tubulin polymerization to occur. And so now like this is basically like the last step of, of mitosis where everything comes together. And so there's a series of other proteins that are uh, a series of other proteins that are activated that enable rapid polymerization of tubulin to then pull apart and segregate the chromosomes. And once that successfully happened, they've done their job. And now they just need to create a cytoskeleton that enables this new daughter cell to be a whole cell and exist. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, let's let's follow up later with that. Okay. Um, are there any other questions? Okay. We'll press on. So there are a lot of chemotherapeutic drugs that are antimitotic. Um, chemotherapeutic drugs are uh, typically drugs that are used in cancer. Vinblastin is one that causes tubulin aggregation. Um, and if, if you remember, catastrophe is kind of this key part of, uh, of tubulin polymerization. And if there's no, if there's no ability for, uh, for catastrophe or disassembly, uh, they'll, that'll promote cell death. Uh, and I forgot to say, antimitotics, as the name implies, are drugs that uh, kind of that are involved with uh, inhibiting mitosis. Uh, Nicotazole is another drug that promotes uh, microtubule depolymerization. So what's pretty key uh, here is to note that tubulin, and this was noted in the pre-lecture, tubulin rings, it's like a, a 13 tubulin monomer ring. And one of the things that ends up happening uh, with uh, some of uh, with these drugs is that it changes the 13 ring tubulin structure to a 20 ring, which then and does not enable for tubulin filaments to fit within the uh, mTOC. And so then all of a sudden that that inhibits the ability for stabilization of tubulin filaments if it can't actually fit within the mTOC. Oh, sorry, I said mTOC, within the kinetochore, forgive me. Um, Taxol is another drug that stabilizes microtubules uh, and it blocks cell division. It actually uh, triggers apoptosis. Uh, we talked about apoptosis before being a programmed cell death. Um, some of these drugs were originally identified in plants, and that's pretty true for uh, a lot of drugs. Uh, and once they're identified, uh, usually by like these drug discovery groups within uh, pharmaceutical companies, They'll then purify them and set it, synthetically derive them. The next class of cytoskeleton proteins are actin filaments, uh, or also co historically called microfilaments. Um, compare, uh, unlike tubulin, um, actin filaments, uh, both the uh, either positive end or negative end, can actually be are actually able to be free, and while microtubules were, or while tubulin was a GTPase, actin here is an ATPase, meaning that it has an affinity for ATP. So for actin polymerization, what ends up happening here is that typically, while we can have growth at both ends, usually uh, by nature of their structure, the positive end is where most growth occurs. But again, this is where it's really different from tubulin. 
both ends can both ends are free and can have growth for an actin filament. Yet it typically occurs at the positive end. And that's because usually the critical concentration is lower at the positive end as well, uh, by nature of the uh, by the nature of the structure. And so, uh, the positive end is pr uh, predominantly occupied by ATP monomers, and the negative end is occupied by the ADP actin uh, monomers. Uh, and again, ATP hydrolysis typically accentuates these differences between the positive and negative end, indicating that. Uh, similar to like the GTP cap, the end that has a ATP, uh, more actin ATP units will have a lower critical concentration, meaning that it has a lower threshold for polymerization there. And what ends up happening is with these uh, green monomers being actin ATP, these blue ones being actin ADP, uh, there is more likely, uh, what ends up typically happening is that these actin ADP monomers disassociate uh, will, because it's an ATP ace and there's an ADP molecule on it, it will lose the, it will lose the ADP and bind to uh, an ATP molecule and then come in over and uh, polymerize and extend the positive end. And this like recycling is what we call treadmilling for during actin polymerization. So a few of the key proteins that help aid with this actin polymerization. Uh, profilin is a, uh, it helps to shuttle and promotes nucleotide exchange, swapping ADP for ATP. So here, uh, what ends up happening is that uh, the, the blue, being AT, uh, blue being actin ADP, uh, it helps promote uh, the uh, exchange for actin ADP, actin, forgive me. Uh, it will help promote the loss of ADP and uh, uh, then enable actin ATP to form. Uh, thymosin is also a buffer. Uh, what it ends up doing is uh, it sequesters actin ATP uh, until there's kind of a need for it. Uh, and it'll help, that helps to regulate, it helps to regulate actin polymerization so that it's not constantly occurring. So when there's a need for actin monomers that have ATP on them, It'll, it'll provide that monomer for actin polymerization. And so, again, profilin will help, uh, help with the exchange, and then you'll have actin polymerization and growth on that, uh, on that actin filament there. Uh, there are other forms of actin filament polymerization. Uh, the, there are other forms of regulation for actin polymerization. Uh, cofilin is another buffer that helps to buffer out ADP actin. So thymosin buffers out ATP actin, uh, cofilin does ADP actin. Uh, gelsolin is an actin severing protein. So like it'll actually cut and sever actin filaments. And finally, alpha actinin and phy uh, phylamin will actually cross link uh, actin filaments across each other. Uh, there's a few toxins or chemicals that are mushroom derived that we use to either stain or uh, manipulate actin filaments in research. A really common one is uh, called phylloidin. It comes from, uh, from uh, uh, phyllotoxin in mushrooms from the death cap mushroom. Uh, it's an actin filament stabilizer. Uh, so typically what, uh, if we want to try and image the actin cytoskeleton in cells, uh, we'll just add in phylloidin, and it usually have some fluorescent protein conjugated with it that enables us to pretty quickly look at uh, the actin cytoskeleton in cells, and it helps us to basically answer a few key questions of what that kind of what current state that cell is in. Uh, and it will, uh, it's incredibly toxic and can cause uh, liver failure if ingested, uh, as because we all know uh, the death cat mushroom by name is fatal. Uh, another Another uh, mushroom-derived chemical, cytochalasin, uh, it's an actin filament destabilizer, uh, and it allows us to kind of on the other end to tinker with the actin cytoskeleton that's also derived from mushrooms. Um, some of the ways in which actin cytoskeleton plays a, role, plays a role in cell biology is cell motility, cells moving uh, across space. And there's a few different ways in which cells are able to move across, move across uh, a given space. 
Oh, it's not going to work. Well, uh, I'll try and have that fixed and see if I can post that on uh, on an announcement. But uh, one of the first uh, forms of cell motility is uh, lamellopodia. It's this sheet-like movement where uh, the actin cytoskeleton enables certain cell populations to move uh, move almost like in a wave across a certain uh, domain of space. Uh, another form is uh, Pseudopodia, you can kind of think of it as like fake feet that kind of protrude out from a cell membrane that's driven by actin polymerization that helps with cells moving across a certain area. Um, another, oh, forgive me. I did not include it here, dang it. Well, there's a new, uh, there in the last few years, there was another form of cell motility that was recently, um, uh, recently identified, but uh, I didn't add it here. So that's something I'll also add on an announcement. Uh, and finally, finally uh, uh, philopodia is another one that uh, the cell that's near and dear to my heart, fibroblasts, typically employ as they try and extend out these protrusions that help them uh, migrate and move. And a lot of this is driven by actin polymerization, the actin cytoskeleton promoting the cell movement or crawling that is really key for uh, immune cells uh, promoting motility across certain spaces to get to a invading pathogen. For cancer cells, my, uh, metastasizing from a primary tumor to form secondary tumors. And a lot of this is enabled by, a lot of these forms of motility of cells moving is enabled by something key called uh, actin nucleation. What this is, is uh, it's the ability for a primary, uh, like a, a, an original actin filament to have branching events that promote uh, actin filaments to grow off of them at uh, these 70 degree angles. That's enabled by two key proteins here, ARP23 and WASP. ARP23, uh, what ends up happening is it uh, helps with the nucleation of these new uh, actin filaments growing from an original one. And WASP is a key activator of ARP23. So when the two of them come together, um, when ARP23 and WASP come, come together and form this complex, they, uh, as you can see in uh, up here towards the top, that's going to be an, a new branching point, a new branch point from which another actin filament will grow off of an existing one. And what you can eventually see is that if you look in with uh, electron microscopy at right at the cell membrane, you can see a ton of branching points pushing up on right on the uh, surface of the cell membrane there. Now, to bring this all back to listeria, um, the, viral, the virulence factor for listeria is called ACT-A. Uh, it's this protein that's kind of on the back region, uh, right, behind the, the, uh, right behind the bacterium. And there's this proline-rich portion that binds to a protein called VASP. It's part of the WASP family that we saw on this previous slide here. And so, as we saw in the previous slide, that WASP activates ARP23, the same thing happens here. VASP, because it's a, a protein from the same family, can actually activate ARP23 and will promote the nucleation of actin filaments right back behind uh, a listeria bacterium. And what you end up seeing is that there's this rapid nucleation of many uh, actin filaments that are then cross-linked across each other with alpha-actinin that uh, forms the comet tail that pushes listeria throughout the uh, interior of a cell. And so the key point here is that ACT-A is the uh, virulence factor for listeria uh, that promotes the binding of VASP, similar to WASP, but not the exact same, but uh, it functions the same way, that promotes ARP23 activation and subsequent uh, actin nucleating and poly uh, polymerizing behind the listeria bacterium. And this is uh, staining for uh, actin filaments behind a single uh, listeria bacterium here. So some of the treatments for listeriosis. Uh, for healthy people, it just takes time. Uh, unfortunately, that's time characterized by diarrhea and fever, unfortunately. <laughs> um, for immunocompromised individuals, uh, they're typically put uh, on antibiotics to help clear the bacteria. Uh, modes of prevention, uh, 
It's not fun, but avoiding soft cheeses made with unpasteurized milk, uh, feta brie, queso fresco, all of which are unfortunately delicious. Uh, avoiding uh, poorly refrigerated meat and fish and making sure that there's proper uh, food safety and hygiene. If the cytoskeleton or cell motility is something that interests you or something that caught your attention, uh, there's a few folks in our research community here at UVA that are plugged in with that. Uh, particularly, I would say Doug D. Simone, who came here quite a long, uh, I'm not gonna say quite a long time ago, who came here a while back at UVA and helped uh, kind of put UVA on the map as a uh, premier research university studying some of these phenomenon, uh, as, well as, the, uh, as well as Dr. Schaefer and Dr. Helmke. Uh, with that, uh, I just want to ask, are there any questions before, <laughs> before we're dismissed? Are there any questions? Yes. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's a protein on the, uh, that kind of, in, in, uh, is coming off the back of the Listeria bacterium. It's already there. Yes. Are there any other questions? Yes. Act A has this region on it that promotes the binding of VASP. And VASP is similar to WASP in our in our in mammalian cells, but VASP will promote the uh, act activation of ARP23. And that's like a key protein that promotes um, actin nucleation and polymerization. Yes. So what causes the capacity for active fibers for Listeriosis? So it's forming those active things for the cutting them off. Because it seems like the gene disappears. Yeah, so typically what promotes that catastrophe is, uh, again, the monomer concentration going down in the local environment. If there's, you know, well, there are times where the actin filament's polymerizing a lot, and if there's no longer a need for polymerization, no other, other proteins are driving um, monomer concentrate monomer expression of actin of new actin monomers then that then it's uh, monomer concentration is below the critical threshold and you get catastrophe of actin filaments that would imply that there's a very fine concentration threshold above which you know there would be no below which there would be catastrophe once yes that's that's a critical concentration so there's such a fine balance how do you find such an excess i'm just gonna turn on the recording turn off the recording real quick hold on I think